extremely excited being here in Nairobi and being able to connect with uh, not only partners that have accompanied the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production and its programs that are connected remotely, but also being able to connect freely and openly with any individual stakeholder that is interested in circular economy and the sustainable consumption and production movement. My name is Jorge Laguna Celis. I am the head of the Secretariat of the One Planet Network. I from the United Nations Environment Program. I am really honored and excited to be your moderator today. Due to the current sanitary crisis, we were compelled to organize this workshop in a hybrid format with speakers intervening both online as well as directly here from Nairobi. I will just start very briefly because I am very excited with the speakers that we have here in Nairobi to do a quick introduction of the speakers that are accompanying me here from the United Nations office in Nairobi. Mr. Silvio Albuquerque, His Excellency, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Brazil, who is here. Madam Andrea Mesa, who is the Minister of Environment of Costa Rica. Madam Florica Fink Hujer, Director General, Director General for Environment at the European Commission. We also have the presence of Honorable Kaidas Ramawano, Minister of Environment, Solid Management and Climate Change, Republic of Mauritius, and Mr. Ara Kobala, Seed Executive Director. So as you see, we are all together here gathered in Nairobi and really pleased to connect with wonderful speakers, which I will introduce as they take the floor. Before we start, I would like to let you know that this session is being recorded and the recording will be shared on our website www.oneplanetnetwork.org. To open this workshop, I am honored to invite Ms. Inger Andersen, Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, who has prepared a welcoming message for us. I'm pleased to speak to you at this UNEA side event on delivering for people and nature, organized by the One Planet Network. Decades of relentless and unsustainable consumption and production have brought us here on a hothouse planet, on a planet where the natural world is being rapidly eroded, and on a planet where lives are being cut short by the toxic trail of economic growth. But if we live in a time of unprecedented challenges, we also live in a time where there is great understanding of just how interconnected people and the planet truly are. The choices we make resonate far beyond the little sphere of our own influence. So this is the role of the One Planet Network to help us make these sustainable choices. This requires empowering consumers to make resource efficient choices. This requires collective frameworks to transition and transform food systems. This requires building out circular business models and redirecting financial flows to transform hotspots in value chains. And this requires embedding sustainable consumption and production into every multilateral instrument of environmental governance. This, in essence, is a task ahead for the One Planet Network. I look forward to hearing more about your discussions today as we seek to lift off for people and planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Executive Director, for this inspiring message. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the current unsustainable patterns of consumption and production that prevail throughout the world today are widespread. They are dependent on the processes that our economic models are following. They are using and disposing an ever increasing amount of natural resources, which we can put to better use for people and planet. This is causing and are the underlying causes of the triple planetary crisis that are striving our current uh, unsustainable use of resources. As a consequence, our patterns of consumption and production are really creating the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the pollution crisis. The good news is that there are solutions. We can all live in a, in a, a situation in which we can really live within the uh, a, a comfortable lifestyle. These are and in a, in a planet, in a situation where well-being and prosperity for all people can be achieved. This is the vision of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
We will now proceed to our first component of this panel today, which is about hearing the insights and the global perspectives to understand the commonalities and the differences that different parts of the world face and how we can work together to achieve the world goals that we have set for ourselves in Agenda 2030. I am really pleased in this connection to welcome uh, Madam Florica Fink Hujier, who is the Director General from the Director General for the Environment of the European Commission, to hear a global perspective from the European Commission. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, for having me. And uh, thank you for being in this round. And also here in Nairobi, we are precisely nature-based solutions, but also uh, reducing uh, consumption to circularity is uh, part of our big agenda, especially when we think about plastics and reducing plastics and uh, the plastic uh, global plastic treaty mandate. So I think a very timely discussion. Thank you very much for that. Uh, also to say that uh, One Planet was driving this uh, along for quite some time, bringing different stakeholders together. We now have a long-term uh, program framework, which allows us to then operationalize it. And I think this is where we have to go. You know that uh, the European Union has been one of the drivers for gas theory, for the global alliance, for um, the consumption, uh, for the uh, resource efficiency. But we also joined uh, regional alliances. But this is a very high level commitment, which is needed. If you don't have the high level commitment and the understanding that the politicians go in that path, you cannot implement it on the ground. But now we have to go also and implement it. In the Commission, we have what we call the Green Deal. You might have heard about it. And within that, uh, the idea going from uh, a linear to a circular economy is really key. And we see very much um, circular economy not so much as an enabler, but actually as a solution, at least uh, as part of uh, the enabler solution towards this uh, transformation that we need to have. And it's a transformation that will take time. It's not an easy one. A green transformation is a shock for some, uh, but it will be the only one that helps us to you know, have a sustained growth for everybody. And uh, and something that is in, in, in harmony also with the, with the with the planetary boundaries, obviously. I could give you a bit of some examples uh, how we look at it now. Um, what we see that coming, especially from an environmental um, perspective, the very idea is to reduce the material uptake and the consumption. And as, of course, the European Union, we are big consumers and we have to take uh, that responsibility and turn it into um, you know, a transformation where we not only go on the change internally, but also help others uh, to work with us uh, globally. Now, we have also seen that if we want to be at this threshold for real change, that we also have to go um, on multiple areas and products is and product consumption, but also product production is probably a key for us. And we have started um, at our, in our level, because we are, we are able to regulate from the environmental side um, to look at different types of products. Products that are, are having this um, very high intake actually of, of energy or having a very heavy environmental footprint in, in terms of using water, using minerals and so on. And therefore we thought when if we start on the full life cycle and, and go specifically on specific um, products that have this potential to be very circular, uh, this uh, would help us in that transformation. And we started with batteries because we all know that we will have to go away from fossil fuels into, into electrification. So batteries is a key element. But then now we, what we are starting is we call it a, a general framework of how in future production should take place, which starts at the design phase. Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure it can be uh, done, produced, conceptualized actually, in a way that it is uh, repairable, reusable, upgradable, but if it comes to the end of life, that it can be then recycled and again reused. And that is basically the, the, the basics of, of, of circularity. We looked at, as I said, into areas, and we will look into areas which are, uh, as I said, have been this high potential. We, we will come forward, as I said now, with a framework and that will also um, explain the next steps on textile, 
uh, ICTs, um, cement, steel, all of these. Um, but it has a, a bearing on, on, on the way we produce and consume. And that means we also will have to uh, allow consumers to make these informed choices. And this is all about avoiding greenwashing and avoiding labels that pretend to be green, but potentially are not. That's a tricky area because we will have to see how mandatory we can be or not. But at least make sure that certain minimum requirements have to be um, uh, uh, um, respected so that we can trace also the claims. And I think that's another area where we go. I think this idea of um, going on, on, on products has to be seen also when we not only look at the production of products, you also have to look at the waste stream, packaging. Packaging waste is something where we will look at very carefully. Very complex because at the same time, I give you an example. We go for we went for banning single-use plastic, which meant we wanted to uh, the producer to take back. But if we now look at uh, how to, can we close this loop because waste and packaging has become a commodity as well, which has to be uh, recollected re and then recycled. But who gets it? Mm -hmm. And that's also a, a tricky issue because those who have invested in 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 these loops or others who, who we, because we want to roll it out everywhere, so that are sometimes very tricky issues. Also, issues we have to discuss with industry, with consumers, with NGOs. But the path, I think, the path is very clear, and that is we think we will not be able to go. Um, ahead without um, investing in sustainable production and consumption. Now, the interesting part is, is it's not just in Europe, it's everywhere. And yesterday uh, we had exchanges, and I had uh, myself exchanges with Kenyan entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. many of them coming from NGOs, and they realized there's a potential starting small and going big in, 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 in going into production where you use waste in order to give uh, livelihoods, but also. Um, create energy, new forms of energy, renewable energy, mm -hmm. of course, or at least green energy. And there are potentials in startups and innovation and techniques that, that, that are almost endless. But it needs, of course, financing, it needs courage, right. and it needs political will. And that's why I think we are here to encourage that. And I start. Absolutely. No, and thank you very much because we are providing a great segue on how we're seeing the transition of the One Planet Network and its 10-year framework for program of sustainable consumption and production. Today, after hearing two global perspectives, we will address two high-impact sectors that have been at the core of our work, the buildings and construction sector and the food systems sector. We, by bringing this vision, systemic vision, that's the great heritage of Rio Plus 20, to look at things not in silos, connection, the sustainable development goals, we have advanced it. The next frontier is looking at products, and that is something that we have to tackle. The treaty on plastics that UNEA will adopt puts that on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Perica, for bringing that perspective. Our next message comes from Argentina by Ms. Cecilia Nicolini, State Secretary of Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation. Argentina not only has been providing great leadership on sustainable consumption and production as well, poverty eradication, great examples, but also leading the agenda on SCP as being the chair of the board of the TELYFP. Executive Director Anderson, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, although I wish I could join in person, it is an honor to participate in such an important event. The current crisis, depletion of natural resources and biodiversity, climate change, and increasing pollution come with unbearable social and economic costs. They jeopardize every country's prospect for sustainable development. Reversing that trend requires a profound, equitable transformation in the way we consume and produce. It requires a development model in which people everywhere can live well and better based on an equitable use of resources in harmony with nature. The COVID-19 pandemic has made the urgency of this shift in the way we consume and produce more visible than ever before. 
the necessity to rethink and reshape our economies from both the supply and the demand side appears clearly in the light of the objectives set by the 2030 Agenda. The decision of the United Nations General Assembly to extend the 10 YF YFP until 2030 sends a very positive signal to the world. It tells us about this new global commitment and this determination to change, which also stands at the core of the UNEP's new strategy. The decision of the UN General Assembly is also a responsibility. A responsibility to take our action under the universal framework for SCP further and higher, to connect the dots, to bring communities together, to tackle the root causes of the triple planetary crisis, and by doing so, take the great opportunity we have to act and innovate together. We must look at the challenge in all its dimensions, address the challenge of inequality and the consumption gap that exists between the poor and the rich in the world, the complexity of our globalized economy and value change in high impact sectors. We must mobilize science, experience, and all actors such as governments, the business sector, civil society, and citizens to make the decisions and build the catalytic partnerships that will have the transformative impact needed to build back and build forward better. Through the One Planet Network, a lot has been achieved. We will build on the successful partnerships and solutions in key sectors and emphasize our efforts to enable change, including resource efficiency and circular approaches, consumer information and education, finance and sustainable procurement, digitalization, and human rights. We will do so with ambition to broaden and strengthen our action, engaging with leaders and champions, making sure SCP stands at the core of our global efforts for sustainable development. Argentina is proud to have chaired the board of the 10 YFP together with Switzerland. We have also worked with many other member states through the group of friends for SCP. This global strategy will be critical instrument to support the achievement of international commitments for sustainable development, leaving no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, to succeed, this global strategy needs to inspire, inspire and be inspired by leadership to engage and empower society through inclusiveness and cooperation, build a global movement together with champions at political, business, and society levels. It needs to be based on the best available science, expertise, and country's needs, identifying priorities, as well as the tools needed, needed to achieve structural transformation. It needs to connect sustainable consumption and production and circular approaches to the implementation of multilateral environmental agreements. It also needs to identify practical ways to engage the UN system at the national level and empower networks of national focal points to support implementation, including financial resources. And let me be clear about this. It must include financial resources. It needs to encourage concrete and measurable commitment from countries and other stakeholders, especially the private sector, as well as new financial and technical resources to support implementation. And finally, it needs to identify measures and indicator to track progress and impacts of implementation, including innovative indicators on consumption. Argentina, who has recently published its national strategy of SCP, has remained committed for many years and will continue to do so. And in this sense, we urge other countries and stakeholders to step up their efforts by providing means of implementation for this necessary shift.
We look forward to Stockholm Plus 50 as a great opportunity to anchor the global dialogue on SCP into this new and ambitious strategy. Thank you. I think not only this vision of the areas that the strategy has to pursue, building on what we hear also from Farik and what we were here from other panelists, challenging us to look at areas where SCP and circularity must do better, telling that the One Planet Network has to continue building those tools that will enable countries leave no one behind, but also looking at the areas of innovation, digitalization, finance that are absolutely required. This is a great segue to recognize now Switzerland, who has also been a tremendous partner in this endeavor, not only by leading our sustainable food system program in equal footing with actors like FAO, WWF, and countries like Costa Rica. We will also hear that perspective in a few minutes, but also helping advance the Group of Friends Global Agenda and putting forward ambitious language that is now recognized in the ministerial declaration with the support of all the member states that are here that recognizes our extension and looks forward to Stockholm Plus 50 as a milestone in our support to the 2030 agenda. Madam State Secretary Catherine Schimberger, we welcome you to this panel. Over to you. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to take part in this high level side event. Switzerland has been very committed to the sustainable consumption and production and the 10 YFP adopted in Rio uh, plus 20, which, is, which it supports since its beginning. There is no time to waste, with less time than a decade to meet the 2030 sustainability goals, we must increase our impact. The 10 YFP programs give us the tools to make it possible. At UNIA 5.2, sustainable infrastructure is a key issue. Following the COVID pandemic, numerous recovery pro packages have been injected into big infrastructure projects. The 10 YFP sustainable buildings and construction program must ensure that these investments support resilient and sustainable infrastructure. Mineral resource governance is another important subject at UNIA 5.2. Our economies are literally built on minerals, sand and gravels. They are crucial for infrastructure, digitalization, but also for low carbon technologies. We must therefore work towards more sustainable extinction practices, extraction practices, sorry, with the life cycle initiative and the international resource panel the 10 YFP can help mainstream the life cycle thinking that supports policy making. The food system is another impactful area. The Sustainable Food Systems Program, co-led by Switzerland, has built a network of 200 partners to change the way we think about sustainable consumption and production and food system. There are just a few examples of how the 10 YFP with its One Planet Network can, can contribute to change the way we think and act. Further actions are needed to target those sectors that have the most impact, including the extraction of raw materials, the built environment and services such as the financial sector. In this context, Switzerland welcomes the extension of the 10 YFP's mandate to 2030. You can count on us to continue our leadership on SCP, including the elaboration of the new 10 YFP to 2030. Thank you very much for your attention. Very 
those insightful words and making us to think on the need for a conversation, fair conversation on the global resources used here in UNEA. We are starting that. We look forward to continuing that engagement uh, with the International Resources Panel and with the participation of all member states. Now I have the pleasure and privilege to pass the floor directly to His Excellency Ambassador Silvia Albuquerque. He is a permanent representative to UNEP from Brazil, who was the host country of the Rio Plus 20 UN Conference on Sustainable Development. And he will provide us with a very short message and message on, on behalf of uh, the host country of Rio Plus 20. Over to you. Thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, we're very pleased to be here. And uh, there is a, a, a very concrete reason for that. Brazil is very proud of the, what we call the real legacy, because I have been very vocal on this, and we have just spoken about it recently, some minutes ago, of how important it is to re-emphasize uh, discussing a key issue in... Uh, Ambassador, I don't want to interrupt you. I don't know if we are seeing you well. Maybe you should... Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you can... You can... Sorry. Should I restart or please restart? Yeah. So basically, I, I was saying that I'm very proud to be here representing Brazil because, uh, as I've been uh, very explicit in all interventions that I have made in conversation, bilateral conversations. Brazil has reasons to be proud of the real legacy, and uh, I believe all over the world. And uh, since this is uh, one of the most relevant uh, outcomes of uh, Rio Plus 20, uh, I, I'm here uh, to, to re-emphasize how important this uh, issue is to Brazil and to the th southern countries, if I may speak on behalf of, of southern countries in a way. Uh, because we, we believe that now that we are facing the evil consequences of COVID-19, uh, it has become more clear to Brazil that, that SCP can play a crucial role in the fight against poverty and, uh, and hunger. To be truly sustainable, that's the position that we have. Uh, consumption and production must not only respect the environment, but also be social inclusive and uh, economically viable. So uh, that means that sustainable products and services will also drive decent work, increased wages, gender and racial equality, among other benefits. So better work and increased equity will have, help improve the access to education, sanitation, health services, which in their turn will generate additional benefits in other areas. So including uh, SCP uh, in a self-evident virtual cycle. So our perspective uh, coming from Brazil and being uh, a, a diplomat from a country that is very proud about the real legacy uh, is necessarily one that sees that implementing SCP is therefore a powerful instrument to fight poverty in its various dimensions in a sustainable fashion uh, as it promotes structural long-lasting changes in our economies and societies. So I, uh, I was prepared to speak about the history of, uh, of uh, uh, the institution of the 10-year framework of programs of sustainable consumption and, and, and uh, production patterns. Uh, we, uh, we, but I believe that it's not necessary to, to tell this, the history of uh, the construction of uh, this collective uh, 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 benefits to all of us who fight for sustainable development uh, in, in the world. But we are very proud and very happy that we extended the mandate uh, uh, of uh, the One Planet Network until, and the, the framework programs until 2030, uh, changing to sustainable consumption and production patterns uh, could represent, in our view, the greatest transformation uh, as we advance in the decade of action uh, for the delivery on sustainable development goals. So we are, we are very glad to see those efforts here reflected in your initiative, under your leadership, and we, we want to be very supportive. Count on us, count on Brazil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency. And precisely this panel, it is 
not only to celebrate the successes, but really the value addition is to look forward, and we appreciate that. Uh, and we have now a very interesting panel that would look at the high impact sectors. You have heard uh, the work that the One Planet Network has already done and some of the good examples and achievements. Now we want to hear perspectives from two member states. We have Costa Rica and Finland that would share experiences and perspectives on the one hand on uh, buildings and construction and also on the, on the issue of food systems and transforming them. We will also hear solutions from organizations. With, uh, we have to do a slight adjustment because we have a little uh, work that needs to be done in the committee of the whole, which Madam Minister Andrea Mesa, Minister of Environment of Costa Rica is leading the way. And therefore with uh, big, big, big apologies to His Excellency Ms. Chula Hidansky, Permanent Secretary of Environment and Climate Change from Finland, we will give the floor first to Costa Rica to provide the perspective on food systems, then we will hear buildings, and then we will hear also two organizational views. Madam Minister Andrea Mesa, thank you for making time to be here with us today. Thank you, thank you for and thank you for this invitation to be here sharing the floor with this distinguished um, panelist. Um, sharing from our experience, uh, I will say that this requires a systemic approach is what we are hearing and that, um, and I will share with you our experience related to our long-term strategy, our decarbonization plan, which basically includes the whole economy. And I think that this is one of the first elements. And when we were analyzing and seeing the different sectors, of course, agriculture plays a central role. But the good part of this is that it is not only generating emissions, but it could be part of the solution. And this is how we see it right now. And when we take a look at this systemic approach, we understand, and this is where SCP plays a critical role, that we need to see the whole value, ch value uh, chain, how things are, of course, produced. And, uh, and it's the way that we have been working with the Ministry of Agriculture. So we came together, we started this agro environment agenda, working together, identifying which are the products that generate more emissions, uh, which are the products that are also very critical for food consumption and that are critical to generate jobs. And I totally agree with what you said ambassador this is about also the social aspects and the impacts around those social aspects so we worked together and we were defining some strategies for some of the sectors as you know costa rica and our coffee this is really part of our tradition and culture and we started with the coffee and we were identifying specific technologies packets of technologies where we can produce coffee, but at the same time reduce emission and at the same time have a better price in the market. So it, it is a win-win situation. And what we are doing with other products as well, with other uh, commodities, and, and we're working with livestock, which is a, a complex one, but we are achieving and we are we have also NAMA in livestock. We have a, a NAMA with rice, uh, now sugar cane and other ones. Uh, and the positive and the good news here is that we we can work together, these two ministers that sometimes, you know, we have seen each other as enemies at a certain point, but right now we understood that this needs to be under this systemic approach and that we need to generate benefits, of course, for the producers. And, and this is, you know, from our part, Ministry of Environment, we want to see reduce of emission, reduce of toxicity, and, and of course, for the part of the Ministry of Agriculture, they want to see added value. They want to see these other co-benefits. Uh, and, and it's the kind of narrative and aspects that we have developed. So at the end, um, within this long-term strategy, and this is the other message, we, don't, we cannot do this transformation in short period of time. So we need to have this long-term vision uh, we also need to include, and, and we are working under what we call the four C's approach, which is how to engage with citizens that are consumers, with companies that are producers, with cities, and at the national level, with countries, all, and all integrated also at the international level. And it's with this four C's approach that we're also working, um, bringing the sectorial part, understanding this long-term vision, 
and also developing, for example, uh, monitoring. And you were saying some some aspects that it's very good. We don't want um, to have uh, um, these these aspects of recognizing companies that are really not doing their their good job. And uh, we are developing also some monitoring systems. And for example, right now we are looking at how is deforestation? Is it happening or not happening? And for example, we in the system that we just developed, we can say that we are producing palm oil free of deforestation. And we can demonstrate that. And this is something that, you know, we want the markets now to recognize that effort. And it's something that we're trying to engage and see that. But at the end, final message, systemic approach, forces engaging the different stakeholders and of course working in the different sectorial uh, um, aspects but I think that we can manage to identify win-win situations <coughs> and I need to go <laughs> well, let's, 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 give a, let's give a hand to our distinguished thank minister you. of environment for Costa Rica thank you very much thank you. sorry for this <laughs> thank you <laughs> And I, I think that this is, a, a, I cannot do a better introduction than the speakers that we have here. This first panel discusses about the trade-offs. This first panel discusses about having this systemic approach and understanding the connection between the different agendas. You've heard very briefly, but in a very succinct manner, the case of Costa Rica working off trade-offs on environment and agriculture, delivering for people, jobs, delivering for nature, at the same time delivering for citizens, consumers, companies that will help economies grow. Similar case we have in Finland, and we're going to hear the story on providing shelter, adequate housing, but also reducing carbon emissions. These are central issues for the sustainable development agenda. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Johanny Damaski, is the permanent secretary, Ministry of Environment and Climate Change of Finland. Thank you very much. I hope you receive me well. Good. Uh, well, good evening, Nairobi. Uh, greetings from Finland. Uh, as you see from my background, we have a bit different uh, climate right now over here, but it's it's uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you today, and thank you very much, One Planet, to invite for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, as you know, uh, uh, well, Jorge excellently actually introduced uh, Finland here. Uh, Finland has a a long history of policies promoting social cohesion and inclusiveness in the uh, housing sector uh, and promoting upward social mobility and reducing inequality are distinct with uh, distinct with uh, distinctive to uh, Finnish society and uh, affordable housing has a role key role in this we know that uh, homelessness increases social problems that's quite clear as well well as mental and physical health problems. This is why Finland has been uh, persistent in finding solutions to combat homelessness. Uh, one of the key instruments against homelessness in Finland has been the housing first principle. Uh, in this housing first model, uh, housing itself or dwelling, if you like, is not a reward to a person that has uh, uh, challenges in his or her life. Homeless persons receives once they, their life is, uh, and sometimes it is a reward for a person that ha doesn't have a home, uh, a kind of a reward that he receives or she receives when they are having their life back on track. But in this uh, housing uh, model that we have in Finland, the foundation is the housing itself or dwelling itself. So in order to put life back on track, one needs the housing first. And this has had a very high impact in Finland, and this is a principle that we are using. So when a person has a home, it's so much easier for them to focus on solving their other problems. In our experience in Finland, housing support, uh, a well-designed housing policy and good community planning are cost-effective ways to improve health outcomes and reduce healthcare costs. Uh, the housing market has to work, and in Finland, we are battling this on two fronts. Uh, on the one hand, we are constantly developing ways to support the construction of, of affordable housing. And on the other hand, we are providing housing and income benefits for low income households. So this is basically how we uh, describe our, um, our, our model. So housing comes first and then you get the benefits. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you very much, everybody. 
Thank you very much, uh, Juhani. And let's continue a little bit with this conversation on, I like this, uh, putting people at the center of uh, sustainable development and looking at how we ensure that putting people at the center helps us address it at the same time, the environmental challenges. That is the greatest challenge of the 2030 agenda. And doing so, as we heard from Madame Corica from the European Commission, looking at the way we produce, at the way we design, at the way we consume, and at the way we meet the basic needs of our population. Let us move now uh, from that same perspective to Victoria Kate Boros, who is the Director of Advancing Net Zero World uh, Green Buildings Council. From your experience, what messages you can give that this is strategy? for sustainable consumption and production that embraces circular economy approaches should deliver from the perspective of your organization. Victoria, thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you to everyone for inviting us to provide this perspective. I think it's a really um, important part of the narrative and the the approach to systems transformation that we're looking at this from both a, you know, how do we drive systems change from a um, from a, a procurement point of view or a public policy point of view, but also what what is the role that that, uh, that businesses can bring. And, and so I'm, I'm pleased to share that perspective with you here today. And I'd like, first of all, to congratulate um, Finland uh, for for their leadership in tackling whole life carbon emissions through their policymakers. Uh, we often refer to their policies when speaking to other countries. So I'm delighted to be um, sharing the stage with Johanny today. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think the role here, like we've we've heard about the role of the building and construction sector that can be responsible for around 40% of emissions um, globally, but also within specific cities. So we know what the challenge is here um we know how to address uh the operational carbon associated with buildings which can be a large chunk of that proportion depending on what your grid looks like and yet we continue uh to build buildings um in some countries with with no energy codes and in a lot of countries codes that really don't um sort of sit within the trajectory that we know needs to be taken in order to really drastically reduce those emissions. But we know that it's possible. There are buildings all around the world in different climatic zones, in different um, uh, geographies that are actually achieving net zero operational emissions, you know, generating as much energy as they use on site, being highly efficient and providing fantastic internal environments for their occupants and the benefits that that brings to those people who, who use those buildings. And there's, you know, studies and data all over the place that shows that this is the right approach to be taking. And yet, as I say, we're, we're continuing to build in some markets and especially where, where we expect, expect a huge amount of, of growth and, and projections of development in the future um, where those energy codes simply don't exist. And that's concerning because that's only a slice of the pie um, in terms of those emissions from the sector is concerned. You know, we know that um, steel and, and concrete uh, and, and other materials can actually make up as much of, as 50% of, of, uh, of a building's footprint. And again, in some places, where those buildings are very efficient and the grid might be very low carbon, the proportion of embodied emissions is, is higher and higher. Um, as you make a building more efficient, the, um, the, uh, the impact of those emissions from the building uh, construction process is even more significant. And so from a, from a kind of industry perspective, what we need to see here is, is innovations and change driven right the way through the supply chain to demonstrate that there are lower carbon alternatives. There are different ways to approach design and construction of, of both buildings and infrastructure that can help reduce some of those emissions that can consider the potential of a circular economy. Let's not just build our buildings for today, but let's build them thinking about the future, how they can be deconstructed in the future. Um, unfortunately, some of the financial models aren't quite aligned with that way of thinking. So, you know, what we really try to do with the World Green Building Council and our Green Building Councils is to bring those perspectives together and, and try and find those solutions. And we're seeing some fantastic um, ambition and innovation from the private sector in the absence of those really highly ambitious policies in the, in the spaces where they're building these these um, these buildings. 
Um, and, you know, some companies are setting net zero targets way ahead of the 2050 trajectories. And as they work through what that means to their business and how they build their buildings, how they unlock that financial capital, they're finding all sorts of challenges that, that we're working to try and overcome. You know, you, you can't set a target for lower embodied carbon if you don't have the data to create the, the life cycle analysis, if you don't have that information. Um, and this is all about creating that really strong signal to the supply chain that the developers are expecting this, investors are inspecting, expecting this. And as we're seeing policymakers, even through their own procurement strategies are expecting this. So, you know, we really need to see some movement within that supply chain to really address deeply those emissions uh, coming from the, the heavy industries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. And we are going to bring then to finalize the conversation on high impact sectors and then hearing a quick reaction for from uh, if, if you wish so Rebecca, before we uh, uh, greet you uh, the uh, WWF International has been a key partner a key player in advancing a food systems agenda together with a number of organizations uh, FAO unit you have been at the heart and at the core of the success of the Secretary General Summit on Food Systems, bringing farmers, consumers, nature, and creating a single vision. What would you like to share with us in terms of our strategy moving forward? Thank you so much. Um, and also really thanks to the organizers for the invitation of WWF. Um, I'm thrilled to follow on from uh, our distinguished colleague from Costa Rica, who gave us the member state approach and, and broadening out some of the themes that she uh, laid out. I think I have really four points I wanted to make in support of where and how food systems really need to play a role in the sustainable consumption and production agenda. I think the first, as we heard from our um, Costa Rican colleague, is that we have a real sense of urgency now to transform food systems. Uh, the IPCC panel report, which just came out earlier this week, I'm sure people saw you know, really heightens the awareness of the sense of urgency on climate uh, and the implications of things like food systems, a major driver of a third of our global emissions, um, and that we cannot take a business as usual approach, right? Modern food systems have been incredible in feeding the world, and we've had, you know, 1900s, 2 billion people on our planet, and we've had that population increase fourfold today to almost 8 billion. So we've done some modern miracles in feeding that population, but we also have done that at the price and costs of our planet and our climate. So that's the first point. It's just the sense of urgency now to act is more than ever. And I, I won't go into all of the impacts of food systems. Um, the second one, as our distinguished colleague from Costa Rica said, is that food systems must and, and are that can be the solution for, for climate but also for nature and people. They are really critical in thinking of how uh, agriculture has a role to play with nature-based solutions for, for, for providing nutrition and livelihoods and really for fulfilling all of the SDGs, let alone SDGs one and two. Um, and so we really need to rethink how to shift away from the current trajectory of modern farming systems to more regenerative, resilient, practices, uh, and, and that is across the entire supply chain in addition to what's being produced in the fields. And we need an all hands on deck approach and how we think about what those solutions look like in the context of where they're being implemented. The third thing and the fourth thing, I think I'll get into more details, um, is really uh, this idea, and I appreciate it again, our Costa Rican colleague talking about in Costa Rica, this whole of economy approach, in order to really do a system shift, we need to think about where food systems touch down across an economy. So it's in the Ministry of Ag, but it's also the Ministry of Environment, it's the initiatives for climate. And this is where we really, and, and it's even health, right? We know food systems are affecting negatively human health and diet related diseases are the number one source of non-communicable diseases uh, globally, not just in countries like mine in the United States. So really how do you align a common policy dialogue around human health, environmental health and planetary health, including climate, uh, to get to that 1.5 degree climate future is critical. And we have a lot of policies right now working at cross purposes. So we need a whole of government approach in looking at food systems transformation. And then the fourth thing I'll mention is around specific actions. The UN Food System Summit, which I appreciated you referencing, was the first time ever that we've really elevated the importance of food systems in cross-cutting agendas. 
that was not a target or a commitment setting platform for member states, but it was where we should take the messages, the actions, the coalitions, the specific things that countries need to do and put them into COP26, now COP27 for climate, for the Convention on Biological Diversity for Nature, the UNCCD on desertification. So we know that soil health, water, you know, these commitments on reducing our food footprint are needed. So quickly, the kinds of things, public sector support to the ag sector needs to be realigned. The UN has put out a really important report. OECD has also a report on OECD countries on where and how public sector support is currently at you know, almost 90% not aligned with any social public good, whether it's environment or human health. And how do we align the billions of dollars going to achieving common goals? The second thing is around um, procurement and sourcing. I appreciated the idea that we need to look at sourcing of our commodities and using public and private procurement as a powerful mechanism for uh, enforcement of these things. Another one is around true cost accounting, where you really look at, you know, while the food sector is about valued at about 12 or $10 trillion globally, it's been estimated that more than double to triple that amount is incurred in social costs to the environment, to health, things that are borne most disproportionately by poor and marginal communities in any given country. And how do we use different analytical tools and assessments to evaluate the real cost of food and the programming that we are delivering around food systems change? The other piece I'll mention, it's not just the public sector who should be on you know, action alert, it's corporates as well. So looking at corporate platforms, such as the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which is a G, uh, greenhouse gas uh, setting platform for companies, as well as the Science-Based Targets Network, where companies are now gonna be making commitments on water, on biodiversity, on oceans, et cetera. These are places where companies who are taking leadership you know, need support and NGOs and others are really helping drive the way. And the last one, there's also platforms around in, in um, influencing the financial sectors, TCFD and TNFD, the Transparency for Climate Financial Disclosure and the Transparency for Nature Financial Disclosure are also powerful tools to really hold the financial sector accountable and really look at where investments are going, uh, whether it's in food systems or infrastructure, uh, as we heard as well. And the last one I'll mention, I would be remiss, is around carbon markets, right, which is a very voluntary measures and private sector mechanisms that really are trying to drive adoption of these practices and provide incentives and signals back to the producers to do the right thing. This is a really exciting area. It's at the same time kind of a wild west area. We need to have scalable models, but also credible, robust uh, models that we know are going to have impact on the ground. Otherwise, we are at risk of putting a lot of good money into bad actions and not getting the outcomes we want. Um, and so I think with that, I'll just, I'll stop and say, you know, there's uh, the metrics piece has also come up and where and how we really use high level platforms to look at where commitments around food systems embed, you know, in cross cutting platforms on climate, nature, and for people, the SDGs, and then use metric tools to track our progress and impact over time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that perspective. I think in this hour, we have heard quite a lot of information. And the challenge is to find out which are those areas where we have to concentrate. What is the niche, which is the dent for the One Planet Network and its sectoral and enabling programs? I would like to invite now Marika Fugia. Give us what would be the top, if I would say, top two, three things. Where do we start now moving toward our next phase as One Planet Network? It's very difficult to say just three, because we heard already here, I started with products, others came on commodities, uh, built environment, uh, you name it. And my Brazilian friends talked about and the impact it will have on uh, livelihoods, on poverty production and so on. What I take from it is, it is being taken up, this idea, and circularity is taken up. It can be used everywhere, and it should be used everywhere. I like very much also in the last intervention to hear that we have three major COPs now coming, which is, uh, I mean, uh, the, on climate, on biodiversity, and desertification. And that means for me, 
the systematic approach. It has to be modeled according to different circumstances, but every every state can do something and can embark on it. And you, you could help in demonstrating it is doable, it is uh, possible, give the technology for it, the capacity building for it, the best practice for it. And from all what we have heard, the different interventions, we have lots of those practices, but it has to be demonstrated that it is um, bankable, if I may say so, mm -hmm. bringing jobs, uh, and it is. But this story has to be told, and these best practices have to be uh, multiplied. Mm, I, so don't ask me now only on this or that sector, because, for instance, from the European Union, we mainstream it in all sectors. So um, that is our approach. In other countries, one starts back, like Costa Rica said, in commodities. It is where it can be done, but it should be done. And that's that's what I take. And you will have this facilitator role now. Not easy, but possible. <laughs> and indeed, you're picking up two areas where we are incredibly active and we would like to share with you in further conversations. One, we have seen great uptake, and then again, so pleased to be here next to Brazil with the three Rio conventions. Let's not forget that's the name, the umbrella name, Biodiversity Convention, Desertification Climate Convention. With these three conventions, we're working in mainstreaming circularity and sustainable consumption prevention through a specific tools. Then also, the value chain approach, it's ready-made approach that you can use almost in any sector to identify the hotspots. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Florica, for joining us today, for being part of the One Planet Network movement. We know you are extremely busy, like all the panelists that we have here. We now move to our second panel, but we appreciate very much that you spent time with us today. Our second panel now continues to focus on solutions. We will hear a number of perspectives uh, from the entrepreneurs. We will hear perspectives from consumers. We will hear perspectives from the youth. And we will conclude with a high level message from the incoming board of the 10 YFP. So without any more transitions, and as we thank our two distinguished representatives from Brazil and the European Union Commission, uh, and we will give you a hand. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. We will now turn into our uh, second component of this discussion. Thank you very much, Minister, for being here with us and engaging us. Sarah, please join us here. Let's move straight with Peter Andrews, who is the Director of Consumer Rights, Innovation, Impact, and Consumers International. We are bringing the enabling perspective. We have here sectoral perspectives. Over to you. Hello, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm just going to share a couple of slides just to highlight uh, some of the, the uh, positions and solutions that we have here. So we consume more resources than the planet can generate and growing rates of pollution and waste make the problem much worse. And if consumption continues at the current rate, we will need three planets to sustain our lifestyles by 2050. Meanwhile, about 1 billion people already live in extreme poverty, unable to access the minimum they need for a decent quality of life. We need to think about the way we produce and consume goods and services. And at Consumers International, we work to reduce the confusion around sustainability by ensuring that businesses and policymakers do all they can to make sure products are safe, durable, resource efficient, before providing clear, reliable information to guide consumer choice. Consumers need to be able to trust the product information that they are presented with and be empowered to make the right choices. We co-lead the consumer information program under the One Planet Network with the governments of Indonesia and Germany, which produced guidelines for providing product sustainable inf information. Now, as you can see, there are a number of fundamental principles highlighted on the screen, as well as aspirational principles. We believe it is key that businesses and governments implement not only those fundamental principles around reliability, transparency, relevance, accessibility and clarity, but they also implement those aspirational principles around collaboration, uh, comparability and so on, if we are going to have a chance of meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Now, looking ahead, we need to consider the future of consumer information in a changing marketplace and a changing environment. 
Firstly, there is still not enough awareness on the devastating impacts of consumption patterns on nature, as we've heard from other speakers. The Consumer Information Programme will be launching a new biodiversity communication toolkit and accompanying resources to support efforts in that space. Secondly, online shopping has seen widespread growth during the COVID-19 pandemic. As more and more consumers globally shop online, new barriers are emerging that are stopping consumers from becoming powerful agents of that green transition. Barriers include inadequate information from sellers. So the number of green claims made to consumers online has reached unprecedented levels, many of which are ambiguous, confusing, or even misleading. And an international sweep of websites found that up to 43% of green claims could be deceptive. There's also inadequate regulation and enforcement of existing consumer rights, especially in relation to e-commerce. E-commerce marketplaces are trying to uh, make a difference. They are trying different methods to help communicate product sustainability information to consumers and give consumers greater incentives to choose sustainability options. But they do not necessarily respond to consumer preferences and they may not fully implement the guidelines. Policymakers too are beginning to legislate in different areas to improve transparency, accessibility and reliability of information of product sustainability information, but it risks becoming haphazard without greater global alignment. Building on the work of the Consumer Information Programme, Consumers International last week launched a multi-stakeholder project aiming to create a global alignment on policy and other solutions. Together we can transform that online landscape of sustainability information for consumers everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for providing that perspective and the solution that informing consumers can provide. Uh, we have heard a lot of the need to engage corporations. That is critical, create leadership, also impact. But let's not forget that most of the employment, most of the economy is within small and medium enterprises. And that perspective is absolutely essential if we want to put people not only as consumers, but also as producers, as employees uh, at the center. Our next perspective in terms of a solutions oriented approach, it's from Ara Popala, who's the executive director of SEED. He will showcase a number of examples of innovations and solutions that are created by small and medium enterprises addressing the systems approach and putting sustainable consumption and production at the center. We also have some slides that he has prepared Thank you, Peter, for engaging. Thank you for that perspective. Ara, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. You know how uh, the Tenerife B goes to my heart, and I'm glad to see that it continues after all the work we did to have it uh, launched at Rio. But in all the work that we have been doing, I realized and we have been fighting when we were even preparing for the Tenerife B that uh, the small and medium enterprises, what we call the mis we are not reaching out to them. We all talk about them, but we have difficulties working with them. Uh, they are closer to the consumers and local communities, while 70 to 90% of the production processes are done by the small and medium enterprises. We hardly consider them and their needs in global discussions, not even in most national agendas. They will just have to adjust that's what we expect but this is i would say unfair we cannot just keep on going top down we have to do bottom up and when we talk about we need to act we need to act there are the ones who shows us how to act and how we can scale it up so there are too many and that's why people are said oh we don't know how to work with them but you have a large number of fantastic examples on how we can move further on that. But we need just to bring them up to the knowledge and see how we work on that. And without the small and medium enterprises, we cannot have an impactful climate action. It's no, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's time that we wake up to that. So I don't I know that uh, they were supposed to put the slide. I am, I am sharing your slides uh, online. I, I was told, I was told. <laughs> okay, so let's continue with that. So for, for us, uh, there is in 2002, a global initiative, a global partnership that was launched by UNEP, UNDP and IUCN called SEED, Entrepreneurship for, for Promoting Sustainable Development. 
And for about 20 years, it has demonstrated how we can effectively deliver on the ground. As I said, there are too many, but we do have a limited number of those examples that can be easily scaled up if we give them the means and the resources. We work with what we call nature positive enterprises. They are really powerful engines to responsible local actions. We are calling for this in all the conventions, but we're doing it at a high political level. We don't go down enough to see how we work with them. They are the ones who will provide you resilience. If you want to have local resilience and green recovery, if you don't associate the small and medium enterprises, it will remain on the shelf I'm talking about it. So they have delivered very good business model and we have been working on that very clearly. Now, let me give you some examples. It could be that the slides are not here because I could have- I think the slides are being seen by the audience here. This is just- Ah, production. okay, so I, I thought- yes. that. Okay, now let me share with you an example. We have a couple of examples, but I will share you with what one from Uganda. Which has been a seed award uh, winner. There has been a problem in the community of unsafe water and expensive clean water to communities and to the schools, facing a serious problem. How to find a really safe and accessible water with local means, something that is affordable and they can do it. To Safiche, which was a found, a, a founded initiative by a young female entrepreneur who produces, sells, installs, low-cost automated filters to eliminate the use of solid fuels. At the same time, it provides safe drinking water for large communities. It supplies filters to the communities, helping them to do it for the NGOs. It brings innovative financial model with local uh, banking systems and integrates a tree planting scheme, the seeds of which will be used in the filter system. So it's really closing the loop of something that we can do. And it provides safe water to the 50 schools around them, saving to families a lot of money from water diseases. Examples like that, we have hundreds, not only on the sea, others in the world are having them. The problem that they are not known enough and we need to see how we can scale them up. But I will come later on the type of proposal that we are making. Thank you very much, Arab. And we will come back. Uh, now we are going to hear other perspectives and solutions. One is from uh, Cécile uh, Durandon, who is the International Director Time for the Planet how you have included people into contributing to the financing of climate-friendly solutions. Cecile, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So, yeah, so one of the main problems today is climate change. It has uh, um, consequences on biodiversity, on food production, on many other things, uh, water supply, etc. And today, as citizens, what happened for a lot of us is like we start to make a few change in our lives, in our behaviors. But after doing that, we are just uh, a bit lost of what we can do more. We feel powerless. And so that's how Time for the Planet was born. How we can, as citizens, just gather everyone and have a tool to act together. And so that's pretty much what we do at Time for the Planet. Any citizen can become an investor, a shareholder in Time for the Planet, and we make it accessible to everyone. And by doing that, it answers the need of a collective action by all the individuals that want to act for, for climate change. And what we do with, with that, it's we basically, uh, once we have all the citizens coming together to a finance solution, we find the solutions, so the innovators, and we match them with entrepreneurs, because we know that a lot of uh, innovators, they are not entrepreneurs, they are not really able to, uh, to, to have a business model, etc. And so we match these two. 
and we finance the innovation with that. And today, we, with Time for the Planet, we are the biggest crowdfunding in Europe. We were able to gather uh, more than 42,000 shareholders, citizens from everywhere, so mainly from France today, because we were born in France, but we are expanding and we already have shareholders in many countries. And that's basically just people that want to invest, but we know actual financial return to to finance innovation to focus on fighting greenhouse gases so that's it i think after there will be a few more questions i will explain a little bit more how we how we do it but basically that's that's what we do we have a community of people from all over the world that just use time for the planet as a tool of action against uh, climate change thank you for that excellent pitch uh Cecilia, we will have, I mean, this panel continues. We have a, a great audience that will be invited to ask questions. And those of you sharing solutions invited to stay, we will take uh, absolutely a few questions to ensure that we engage with uh, our uh, audience. And so be prepared. Uh, we will open the microphones and we will hear those perspectives. Let's hear another pitch. Very interesting now. We heard from the small and medium enterprises. We heard also from the solutions of financing. Now let's hear from Sony. Sony is creating not only content, it's also driving innovation. And we would like to hear now from our next perspective uh, here. Uh, I'm looking here at my notes, Kevin Meyer. He is the senior director of environment, social and governance within Sony Entertainment. We welcome you, Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm excited to be here. So. Um, and uh, I have some slides, so please bear with me one second. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here today uh, representing Sony PlayStation, the gaming company. And I'm very excited to be able to share with you um, what progress that we're making in the gaming industry, both towards inspiring change and also at reducing our own footprint and impact. And I think um, a real um, milestone, a really sort of um, important moment uh, in our industry engaging in this topic was the formation of the United Nations Playing for the Planet Alliance in 2019 at the UN Climate Summit in New York. And we're very proud to be there as a, one of the initial members. Uh, and so all of the major companies have come together um, and make their own individual commitments year on year, uh, both to inspire change and take action to reduce footprint. Um, so, so far, the Alliance has a total of 39 members and uh, some of the activities we've got summarized here. So, we have a number of members that participate in uh, the Green Game Jam every year where we're actually developing ideas and implementing ideas into games in order to inspire change. And in addition, uh, members are increasingly called and making increasingly ambitious commitments to reduce their carbon footprint under the Alliance. The Alliance is growing. We aim to add another 10 members uh, next year. We together have a reach of over 2 billion people. It's huge. And the actions of the Alliance of the members so far have tangibly reached about 200 million gamers. Um, our 2022 focus, we take a thematic view each year, is to look at trees, food, and action on climate change. And as part of that, we'll be looking at implementing uh, continued measurement and reporting and an improved way to do that. Um, last year, about 50 different actions were reported by members. And in terms of the results, uh, just some highlights, uh, we planted around 1.2 million trees. Uh, we made about $800,000 of donations to related charities. And a new area of action for members this year is to implement a new plastics protocol. Um, that's just really a summary. You can see more on the Playing for the Planet website of the sorts of things that the gaming industry are involved in. Um, but in terms of Sony, in terms of PlayStation, um, our actions this last year, um, we have um, a number of areas where we've taken action in that spirit to inspire action and also to reduce our own footprint. So, for example, um, for inspiring action, we, we launched one of our main gaming titles last month. Uh, Horizon Forbidden West. And as part of that, we invested in around the world um, different forestation schemes. And we're basically going to be planting 300,000 trees in connection with in-game actions from players. 
Last year, we invited players to create their own games on the themes of reforestation and ocean protection using our creative game Dreams. And we had over 377 games created by players as entry to the Green Game Jam. Um, we are also in the middle of developing an exciting new application called Climate Station that we're going to make available to all gamers, um, hopefully in the next year, uh, which really shows um, adds gaming technology to show how climate change is progressing and what the future holds and what the solutions can be. Um, we, of course, also use our own web pages to help advise and make outreach um, to our consumers on, on these things. Um, then in terms of our own impact, in terms of addressing resource use, uh, we're stepping up in terms of, for example, we're marking all our plastics in terms of flame retardant content and also what kind of polymers are used to aid recycling. We undertook a major initiative for the launch of our most recent console, the PlayStation 5, to eliminate plastic in the packaging, such that now the packaging only contains between 1% and 7% plastic. And this year, we also started a trial including recycled plastic in all of our games boxes. The trial was a success, and I'm happy to say that we're now rolling that out globally so that each region is using recycled plastics in their game boxes. Um, in terms of carbon dioxide and climate change, we have been working now for over a decade at trying to really reduce the power consumption of our products and engaging in energy efficient technology. And through those steps, we've avoided about 20 million tons of carbon dioxide over this period. Um, we are also now made the new commitment to make our online game streaming service, PS Now, carbon neutral by this year. Um, and also our offices, just not forgetting our own operations, our key PlayStation offices are powered by 100% renewable energy. So basically, in terms of what we're trying to achieve within the company, we really want to be forging a path, showing leadership rather than following. We want to be turning our intention into action. And also, we want to be doing the right things, and we want to be doing those things well. Thank you. Aaron, for providing us with that insight, we will ask in a few minutes uh, and give the opportunity to the audience that it's there. You start thinking to raise your hand. We have a number of wonderful speakers that will be able to answer them. We will also hear some of the solutions that we're seeing at the community level. But before we do so, it's important that we also hear uh, the political perspective again, because a lot of these insights are going to impact the global strategy of sustainable consumption and production and SDG growth that we have been tasked to develop together with you. And in that regard, I am really honored and truly privileged to invite the Honorable Kavidas Ramano, who is the Minister of Environment, Solid Waste Management and Climate Change of the Republic of Mauritius. You have heard an awful thing of perspectives already, Minister. The challenge that we have now is to put it in a concise strategy that delivers for people and planet. So I invite you to provide you with us with that perspective from the board of the NYFP that will guide us from the government perspective in achieving this goal. I stock of this system. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, George. Experts and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very pleased to be amidst such a pool of experts gathered today in the context of this side event to launch a global movement to change how we think, inspire, and act for sustainable consumption and production and circularity. I would like to thank you. Mr. George Lagunaselis, head of One Planet Network, and the whole team who have made this event possible and successful. I am particularly happy about the gaps and the new opportunities we have identified and the new post-2022 global strategic direction to drive the SCP agenda more effectively. Ladies and gentlemen, for sure, we cannot continue business as usual. The theme, Delivering for People and Nature, sets out the tone for putting people and nature at the forefront of our new SCP strategy. There's need to rethink about new innovative ways to change the way we think, inspire, and act. Never before has it been so clear that globally, we need long-term, inclusive, and collective paradigm shift to tackle the triple planetary crisis. Both climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic have compelled us 
to realize to what extent our world is fragile. We need to recreate a balanced relationship with ecosystems on which we depend and inspire SCP battles. The time is now for building back and we must all commit our efforts to working towards building a post-pandemic world based fundamentally on the principle of green recovery. The presentations of today's session have clearly demonstrated that the solution lies in our consumption patterns and our behaviors. Sustainable and responsible consumption and production patterns represent the ultimate tool which can help us reshape our economies on both the supply and demand sides. The themes addressed today, changing behaviors in high impact sectors, appetite for change in food systems, plastic free and low carbon ecosystems in the tourism industry, and leaving no one behind, are very pertinent and offer lots of opportunities for us to combine our efforts in finding innovative green solutions while fostering sustainable economic growth and circularity. Dear friends, if we want to attain the necessary transformational shift to SCP, this is time for action. The 10-year framework of programs, 10YFP, on sustainable consumption and production adopted by head of states at the 2012 Conference on Sustainable Development have served over the years as a universal framework to encourage countries to shift to SCT patterns. It has been an instrumental global framework in the development of multilateral and multi-stakeholder cooperation on SCP, both at the international and national levels. As we know, this led to the adoption of SCP as one of the sustainable development goals, namely SDG goal 12. The 10 YFP team is honored to announce the development of a post-2022 global strategy that will pave the way to further engage countries in fostering sustainable consumption and production till 2030. An ambitious and forward-looking strategy that drives a desired transformational shift while delivering for people and nature. A new strategy will serve as a renewed commitment and continue to towards collaborative efforts to drive SCP. The post-2022 strategy will be supported by science for a deep economic, social, and environmental transformation. We draw on lessons learned and progress achieved so far. We build on knowledge and best practices on SCP and, and engage the collaboration of all actors to inspire change for a more sustainable world. The new post-2022 strategy will also play a critical role in addressing the root causes of the free planetary crisis and thus contributing in addressing the multilateral environmental agreements. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the close of the meeting, I wish to reiterate my gratitude to UNEP 10YFP team for the ex excellent organization of this side event. I also thank once again the panelists, moderators, and resource persons and participants for the intense deliberations and hard work. I think the discussion will continue. We'll continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give a hand to Mr. Romano. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellency, for joining us. Thank you for providing the way, listening to these perspectives together with the other ministers that have been with us today. Now the key challenge it is how do we deliver not only impact because we're seeing impact being created, but how do we make that and we take it to scale? And perhaps this is an area where I would like to ask and challenge some of our speakers that we have here. Let me start with Cecile. We have heard solutions from uh, the climate perspective on financing. How would you take this to scale? What is required to inspire a global movement from the One Planet Network perspective? Cecile, over to you. Thank you. So there is two, two things I would like to say. The first one is time for the planet. So it was born in France, but our goal is to expand uh, in other countries. And so we want time for the planet to be a movement in different countries. So actually we are starting in the UK. 
we already have people uh, all over the world that are shoulders. And what we want is really to have this movement created from each country all over the world, which can just uh, grow and have communities uh, getting bigger and bigger. So today I said we have 42,000 shoulders in France and it's growing all the time. We have a community of people that work together. And so we really rely on this, you know, that it's a tool. So people, they really have, they are part of the company. So they really share about it. And they, it's just the community itself that grows together. Uh, so that's the first thing that we, we think is really important. Another thing that is quite important at Time for the Planet, it's we we rock, so all the innovations we finance, they are in open source models, which means that we have a, a free licensing uh, system and we will have all the innovation that can be copied uh, anywhere in the world. And this way it goes uh, a lot faster. So we will have uh, people copying the innovations everywhere in the world and they can improve the, the innovation. So there is one obligation with the free license is to share the improvement that are done on an innovation, which make it uh, grow faster. And so anyone that is using the free license will uh, improve the innovation at the same time. And so we really want to have that. And something else, of course, is by being, having a big community and a lot of people involved, uh, we grow very fast. But we also hope that Time for the Planet will inspire all the people to have a time for biodiversity, for example. And so just take our model and do the same for other subjects because we are focused on climate change because we cannot do everything. But really, the model we are constructing and uh, everything we are doing, we are very happy to share it to anyone that wants it to 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 use it for any other subjects such as biodiversity or uh, the oceans problem or anything so really that's in the dna of time for the planet to share what we do how we do it etc so that's basically the different thing that we want to do and really i think the, the main strength of a movement like time for the planet is to be a community of citizens that want to act and so everyone talk about it and everyone wants to to make it grow and it's just inspiring to see so much people at the same time just acting together for for one cause thank you and so we have heard these two pers these several perspectives as a matter of fact peter now, from the consumer's perspective, how can we take a, a sort of a, a small tool and take it to scale? What would be your advice? You've heard the model of, 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 the, of uh, uh, Cecile, the time for the planet. You've heard the model of Sony. How are they creating solutions, driving innovation, but also competition as well in making it better? How can we do this from a consumer perspective? We need to take it at scale. How do we simplify it for consumers? Thank you. I think, well, the important thing to start with is that consumers are increasingly passionate about living more sustainable lifestyles. And every day we are all, as we are all consumers, every day we're taking actions that do have an impact on our environment, whether it's through products we purchase or through savings and investments that we make, our pensions, uh, and so on. So there is a drive amongst the global consumer com uh, community to be able to live more sustainably. It's coming up in research that they say uh, that people are saying that uh, they um, are feeling less empowered to be able to make the decisions that they really want to, to align their day to day practices with their values. What we can all do together, that's businesses, that's policymakers, that's civil society, consumer movement, is we can work together to shape the global frameworks that will enable consumers to be able to live sustainably, to have a more sustainable consumption. That means putting in place the policy frameworks. That means putting in place the frameworks that will guide businesses to support people in the marketplace, to both empower consumers and also protect them as well. Uh, that is what we are working to through Consumers International, but more importantly, that's also what all of the different organizations coming together under the UN One Planet Network are setting out to deliver. Thank you very much. Um, Ara, the idea of identifying you said there are hundreds, thousands of solutions that are out there that can be replicated. And you have heard that we have tools to help this replication, we have perspectives, we have political will. How do we drive this change from small and medium enterprises perspective? We have heard in all the discussions 
and we have heard it also here at UNEA, that are all aiming for a global movement to deliver sustainability. But the global movement without the small and medium enterprises, which are at the heart of consumption and production, won't be completed. It's important to fill the gap of this missing link with the small and medium enterprises, what we call the missing middle. They are the ones who connect people and planet. They are on the ground. As I said, there are hundreds, millions of solutions out there, but they are not known and they are not interlinked. And we have not worked enough on the way to scale them up. Enterprises are at different levels and they require different type of support. So that's what SEED has been doing for 20 years. And now we feel the, the need to expand and scale up. We work in a limited number of countries. It has to go wider. We work on our own. We have to connect with others. Others are also working. When we started 20 years ago, SEED was almost alone in this, in this ecosystem. Now others are also working on that. So what we are aiming at now is to establish what we call a global coalition for innovation, circularity, and entrepreneurship. The three words are extremely important. And innovation is really very important at the bottom level. People always think that innovation is for big companies and rich people. No. The best innovation is the deeply rooted innovation at local level that can create resilience. With this, we want to provide, to continue and expand the support we are providing to the small and medium enterprises, including access to finance, working with the different banks on how we can allow them to, to get to the solutions, enable them to replicate and take them out ourselves in, together with UNAC, with MIFP, with go for sdgs with other partners to make sure that we don't work in silo, we work together, we work in a collective manner in order to have an impact. So it's a really system-wide approach on innovation and circularity. And we'll be, we intend to work it around four work streams, basically catalyzing this innovation. And as I said, not just the high level, we will connect the small with the high in order to have an impact working on mobilizing finance at their level for their needs, curating those collaboration between, between small and medium enterprises with the large companies and mainstreaming entrepreneurship in national policies that we can do with the MIFP and then generating good knowledge about that. So if we can have this movement with the small and medium enterprises, we can be much more impactful and circularity and let us not forget they are the first one for climate action on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Arab. And we will make all these stories, presentations, and recordings available online. And there are two words that Arab mentioned that for me are an excellent way of almost moving to our closing component. One, it is that what he mentioned 20 years ago, we were alone. Uh, people speaking about SCP circularity were almost seen like uh, in the fringes, right? Uh, and, and now there is a, an amazing amount of action happening. What we're lacking is connection. What we're lacking is scaling it up. It's bringing these solutions together. And let me now move and ask uh, Kieran, who is with us here from Sony Entertainment and from PlayStation specifically. You have an important role, but also responsibility, which you have spoken not only as a corporation, but also in creating the content that is driving education and that's driving commitment from the youth, right? Yes. And you're using that from an entrepreneurial perspective because you also want your competitors to do the same. What would be the, your messages that you would like to give us to the UN, the One Planet Network, all the speakers that you heard today? How do we scale this up? How do we make it meaningful for the youth, not only as consumers, but as agents of change, and that is where we can scale up. What are your messages that you want to give in this regard? Well, you know, the United Nations were key in 
bringing us together as an industry. And very much, we actually want to, although there are competitors, we want to stand together with them because together we, we have a better voice. And I think the United Nations and also governments worldwide can do a great deal to facilitate these type of corporations, um, to enable the companies can work together, to encourage the companies can work together and set up the mechanisms. Um, I do believe that based on our, uh, the playing for planet model, which came from the United Nations, that other sectors are, are looking to sort of follow similar alliances. And it, not only, and, and I think one of the things I was really impressed by was not simply the action that that's firmed within the industry. But when I, when I got back to the company, people seeing it, people reading about it, um, they were getting in touch with me going, this is fantastic. We've always wanted to do things like this. How about this idea? How about that? It's been a great catalyst galvanizing uh, the teams, the experts, our internal entrepreneurs, our innovators um, to, to sort of join in. And, and it just keeps rolling and, and more and more enthusiasm, more and more engagement. So, um, yeah, these alliances can do a great deal to move things forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And exactly, we have heard, and this is a great uh, component that I would like to highlight. There are models that we heard from Cecile, from Kieran, from Arab, from Peter, that are, and Andrew, that are delivered, that are there, ready-made. And all we need is to communicate, it's to change the way we speak, it's to create those connections, it's to learn. Today we learned, I did some learning and understanding better how the food systems are connected also to the uh, important economic agricultural agendas. Today I learned how it is essential from a government perspective to provide decent social housing in order for people to not only live sustainable livelihoods, but also to reduce their carbon emissions. And how do we combine this together? We heard solutions from consumers, climate, technology, small and medium enterprises, and this is what we're all about showcasing those solutions, learning the models that are working and applying them in other sectors. So with these great announcements, with this commitment from all actors and sectors, it is really great and I am pleased to come to the end of this event. To thank you all of you that have stayed with us throughout, that have participated in this discussion. I want to thank the speakers for their outstanding work and efforts to move SCP to the direction towards a more circular and sustainable economy, social and just as well to tell you that we are going to continue consulting with a number of actors and stakeholders to develop this global strategy for SCP that the Minister of Mauritius and the Ministers of Costa Rica and also uh, uh, that you heard today, uh, Finland and others, Argentina, they provided great insights. We need to use that political will. We want to see you in June in Stockholm in the occasion of the Stockholm uh, an international meeting that will commemorate 50 years of the establishment, not only of the environmental movement, really, but of creating this idea that sustainable consumption and production and poverty eradication are the key for sustainable development. And there we want to launch, advancing in launching this global movement, this global strategy, having our programs not only stronger, communicating more closely, launching the coalition for entrepreneurship we will do it together looking at where we stand on playing for the planet and also with consumers and working also with the rio convention on climate and cecile so we thank all of you for being part of this movement thank you for being in this event today and on behalf of the great team that is composed of the secretariat of the one planet network and the programs of the one planet network that have provided the support to be here with us today. I want to thank you, wish you all a wonderful day. If you are in the Western Hemisphere, a wonderful afternoon. If you are here, a wonderful evening. If you're in Asia, this is the best way that we can in these bleak moments advance in sustainability. It is by working all together, finding solutions, working for people and nature. So one big thank you and my gratitude to all of you. Great afternoon, thank you for joining us in this cycle. Thank you.